Now tonight, as we, we venture in preparing for the seminar, this, I want to get to the manual just now in a few minutes. Uh, I need to give you a little bit of background where I'm coming from so that you don't think I'm, I'm some weirdo that fell out of some place. Um, or I'm trying to teach you something that I heard from someone else. You know, you get a lot of those things. A lot of people preach on things that they stole from someone else. Now, it's not completely wrong because we learn from other people, so we should learn from them. But there's something when you get to a place where it becomes your own experience. You speak out of what God did in your life or through your life. And therefore, I'm not talking about what other people are saying. I, I know that I, I am one of the most, uh, or let's call it, um, informed persons in this nation about this topic. There's a lot of people in the world that I'm still learning from. But wherever I go and when I speak on this, I realize majority of people and pastors don't know a lot on this because many are not even practicing or operating in this dimension. I believe actually that everyone should operate in this. I, should, I believe if you say I want to do the same works as Jesus did and even greater, then, I mean, Jesus healed people every day, cast out demons every day as he preached the kingdom of God. So this should become normal Christianity for us. Now, just another little story. It's a long story that I may not spend a lot of minutes on, but just to, to get you to understand that, that we, we had a lot of experience, and I'm learning even from the experience of others. Um, the seminar on spiritual warfare, I've done, I think, more than 100 times, even more than that, uh, in, in groups like you in front of audiences. And normally when, what we do is that, that at the end of the seminar, like we will do here tomorrow night, afternoon night, is that um, we start ministering to you. And, um, and normally the ministry is very quick and uh, easy. And, I mean, it's great anointing, and you will sense it as God is just moving and touching and healing and bringing deliverance. I've done the same uh, seminar last week in Cape Town and Afrikaans. And um, so I, I know what God is doing. And I remember, I think it was about 1999 uh, or 98. I was here in Camden Park in a, in a city where we, our building was first there uh, using the city hall, um, busy with the same seminar. And during the day, some of my leaders came and said, uh, there's a girl outside that people brought. They said they, they, they've just I mean, brought her from some far away city in Natal. And uh, they said they... The parents of family brought her for ministry, and we must minister to her. And the parents left. So I said to my leaders, just tell this girl we can't give her accommodation. We can't help her really now. Um, I mean, if she organizes her own accommodation, we can see her, make appointments, and some of my guys will spend time and, um, and ministering to her, whatever the need is. Then the next thing that evening while I was busy um, was that someone came in and said she's on the steps outside she cut her, her pulse you know, cut her arms and she's bleeding there to death and um, so that was just a way of forcing us to get involved and uh, so we never realized that that was the beginning of a long term relationship um, I thought I will finish this thing in a day um, and not knowing what this will take us through. Uh, this was uh, set up from Satan himself. But God, because God is always far cleverer than Satan, used everything to, to change it into a, a learning curve, a, you know, growing situation. So we took it to the hospital, all that stuff, and eventually, you know, she came out, and then we said, all right, we will organize a bed for you for one night to sleep with some people, 
And uh, the next day, I think it was a Sunday, we tried to minister to her, and then my guys working with her said, wow, this girl is full of demons. She's a Satanist. Um, you know, she needs a lot of, of ministry. And uh, so and there's no way to send her. And then I made the mistake of saying, all right, she can sleep tonight in our home. Um, then tomorrow we must organize something for her to, you know, to find another place. I mean, just tonight. And with that, I organized that some of our counselors also sleep in our home to watch her and to be there. And uh, because I need to focus on my ministry and work. So uh, never knowing that that was the beginning of a two and a half years um, intensive ministry to this girl. She was about 19 at that stage. Uh, that one night stay in my house ended up to be two and a half years. Um, and that ended up to be about every night for the two and a half years that Tisa and I spent two, three, four hours in ministry to her. And it became very exhausting. I mean, my marriage was pushed to the limits. I mean, if there was ever a time of running away, Tisa many times said, I can't take this. I'm going. You won't ever see me again. And uh, so we went through those experiences. Uh, and... And it took us quite a while to discover actually the mission of this girl because she was coming out of one of the leaders of Satanists in South Africa's home. She was stolen as a little baby and being raised to be a bride of Satan. And then her mission was, in this case, they dropped her with me to destroy our ministry and my marriage. That was her job description. She's there to infiltrate my house, that she already did, and then to infiltrate my marriage and to destroy the ministry. So here I had this girl in my house. We, out of the counseling, we, we realized she was stolen as a baby and then start a whole process to, to get a real mother. We change her name, uh, register a real name of a mother's surname, uh, not the mother, but the grandfather's surname. And, and a lot of things happened. So she got a new name, and uh, we call her Michaela. And uh, so we start a whole relationship. Every day when we ministered to her, there was just new stuff. She had uh, 38 personalities we had to deal with. Um, and so in two and a half years, we, we took it step by step to get these 38 personalities to blend together, to become operating as one. Uh, every personality had 10,000 demons in it. And so you deal with everyone, casting out the demons, and do all the healing for every situation. She was raped, I think, more than 10,000 times in her life. Even as a little baby girl, she was introduced into Satanism by being raped. And... Uh, upside down cross next to her mouth and uh, there's many things some are too 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 bad to say it here um, so here we had this girl in our house dealing with these things and i mean we knew a lot about satanism at that stage because we got involved in, in people and bringing them out of that but never realizing i would have this in my home intensively I mean, in two and a half years, I've learned more about the spirit I mentioned, Satanism, and all the detail than most people in the rest, the whole of their lives. So we were so intense with this thing, and we've also learned a lot about personalities, uh, what we call the ID, this, uh, this, uh, this associative identity disorders. So that was also a learning curve, and get into more and more and understanding that. And while we're busy with her, there was a lot of other things and people, even in those, those two years, uh, our church was always filled with a lot of Satanists coming in. Um, they were always there. You pick them up, you see them, see them in the spirit. Some of them would be outside. Some are there to be helped, you know, want help, and some are outside, you know, always busy. Um, and the covens of the Satanist covens that used to be in Kempton Park were always around us. At my home, car parked in front of my home, they were always busy with things. And um, so... It's interesting that since those days that we've been very inter intensive, intensely involved in, in uh, praying against what the Satanists uh, were doing, uh, 
the, the covens of Satanism in, in our area diminished, actually started to, to disappear. And uh, where at the moment there's, as far as we know, um, maybe one, but uh, they're weak in functioning in our area just because of uh, this, the, the position we and many people are, were taken against their actions in this area. So to make a long story short, uh, eventually after ministering and learning a lot from this, old, uh, this girl, uh, we came to a place where she was really beautiful, unique, restored, healed. I uh, got her to testify one day in front of a whole big audience. Uh, have it still on video recording. Uh, she was talking about herself. I had some introduction or speaking to her in front of the camera. So uh, just to get some of that. Some of the counseling sessions with her I actually recorded. I had a camera on, you know, as she was switching between personalities, the demons coming out. So I recorded a lot of that those years because every day for two, three, four hours we were just involved. I mean, you would send her to the room. You think we're going to sleep now. And then you hear, we, we are on the second floor. You hear the steps at the footsteps, someone coming up. So, oh, is Michaela coming up? And we just wanted to sleep. And then we said, all right, who are you? We, we, we made a joke, always said, knock, knock, who's there? Because it's another personality. One personality went to sleep and another one got up, you know. And then there's another voice, you know. She said, I just wanted to come and talk, you know. I said, no, Michaela went to sleep, so I want you also to go and sleep. Yeah, but just this one thing. And, you know, like if you get involved, understand it, they always want attention and help and prayer and all love and all those things. So it was very interesting. Eventually, after we got into a season where she was really beautiful, healed and, and testifying and a worshiper, and she was helping us a lot in ministry of people. Um, she went to visit family, was raped again, and the whole process of what we did in two and a half years was destroyed in a lot of incidents that happened. Eventually, she went into a coma and died, and we were so glad. Um, we were really glad. I mean, it was a shock, uh, but I was so glad, Lord, we can rest. <laughs> And uh, she was in heaven. She's in heaven, and I'm really glad she's there. One day we will see again. Uh, but that was, I think, God allowed her to be in our lives to, to, to get us to learn a lot from that. I learned so much. Uh, the spirit I mentioned, the demonic uh, in our city. Uh, through her, I ran into a lot of demons of the city. One of the most powerful demons of Camden Park I ran into. And... Uh, privilege of sending him to hell, and um, that I will later explain, you know, our, our purpose of working against the evil, and it's just interesting, you know, as you, you get involved working with people and uh, in a spirit I mentioned, it's just so interesting when you get to, uh, to see things in the spirit and, and see how God cleans the atmosphere, ch change the city, change lives, bring freedom to people, you really learn a lot about this. So for me, it's not about some theological arguments to try to prove to you some existence of some demons. For me, um, they are actually more real than you. Um, you know, when you get to see in the spirit and work with this, I mean, they are there. You see them in people, you see them in areas and places, and they are there. And you get, I mean, sometimes I just ignore the, the demons because... You don't want to get involved. If I go on holiday, I don't want to see them. I want to sleep, rest, and, and actually, God doesn't expect me to, to do anything in the spirit when I'm relaxing. I sleep well every night of my life. I never have any nightmares. Demons do never irritate me, never come close to us. Uh, God's angels are so faithful around us, protecting us. Uh, my leaders are praying for us, covering us with prayer. Um, so to operate in this thing is, is not scary. You just live in a position of God's protection and, and have fun. I mean, we enjoy life more than most people. Uh, we really enjoy God, His goodness, worship Him, and give love to people and ministering to them. 
Just last week, I've ministered to a group of young people, and they are very young people, most of them in their 1920s, 21 too. And it's just fun to spend days with them and lay hands on them, and demons are coming out as God heal them. I mean, it's just it's part of life. So, welcome. I would uh, love to minister to you and help you to really come into freedom. And maybe, maybe there's a fly that I need to finish off in Jesus' name. That's what we call demons. They are like flies. There's one thick, big fly that we call Satan. And he's been kicked out of heaven. He lost all, all aspects of heaven. Has got no beauty. And you will find in the manual later his, kind of his face. All right, on the next page it says Theologos School of Ministry. Just a few remarks there. The first block there, the major reason, that comes from a book that is, is being recently written, Revolution of George Barna. The major reason why most local churches have little influence on the world is that their congregants do not experience transformation in their identity. Now that's a mouthful. And I can preach an hour on that, but uh, for some of you, you will catch it. Some of you have heard that being said by me earlier. To change your identity is all about, you know, that's why you are here. You know, Jesus did not come to this earth. Can I shock you? He didn't come to this earth to take you to heaven. That is, the, that is eventually what's going to happen, if you call it that. Actually, God doesn't call it that. But for your understanding, let's say you're going to heaven. But Jesus came to earth. To bring the kingdom of God to the earth. He came to earth to make you a ruler. To rule upon this earth. And establish the kingdom of God upon this earth. Not to sit and to go away. Or like some people are singing, we will fly away. You are not here to fly away. You are here to get Satan under your feet. You are here to rule on behalf of God. You are here to bring what is heaven the substance of God's presence to this earth. We are not here and say, Oh Lord, it's so difficult, Father. It's so, I mean, it's like hell on this earth, Lord. Won't you just come and take us to heaven, Lord? We can't wait to go, Lord. That's not God's way. God doesn't want to just take you away and say, All right, I know it's so bad down there. I just rescue you from this bad world. God is sending you into this world to change it, to establish His kingdom, And he said, his glory will cover this earth. And Jesus only comes back when his glory has covered this earth. And I'm going to prove it through scripture to you. That's why we are here to rule. Not to run, to rule. To establish his rule and presence. Now, changing your identity is what it's all about. It means that you as a person must become like God. And it happens through Christ. As you embrace the the kingdom of God, the cross of Jesus. God wants to change you from your spirit, your soul, your body, your relationship, your finance, everything in your life He wants to change. And that is your identity. You have a spiritual identity. That's being changed by what we call be born again. You become a Christian by the experience of being born again. That means your spirit is made new or a new in the spirit of God and we call that you are being born again. So you are saved through Jesus Christ, and that is your spirit being. Your soul, that we had in the previous seminar, are being saved. So your, your spirit is already being saved. Your soul is being saved, and it is still being saved every day. As the Bible says, be transformed you know, by the renewal of your mind. That's a process as the soul being is being changed to become like Jesus. So you are saved. You've been saved in your soul, and you will be saved in your body. Because one day your body will become new. You will have a new, resurrected, new body being given to you like Jesus had when he came back to us after resurrection. And uh, so one day your body will even be, be saved when it is perfect. You're going to live in a perfect body. So God is, uh, you are mainly a spirit being with a soul at your control room. And you're living in a temporary body that one day you will have a permanent new body. And, uh, and we will then be in the presence of God. So God wants to change your identity, starting by your spirit, your soul, 
your body, and what we sense in our body is what we call healing, as we are living a maximum healthy lifestyle. That's our next seminar coming up, as we talk about health and healing. And then your relationship, that's the next, next seminar later this year, when we help you to have abundant life in your relationship, your marriage. And then in your ministry, or your, the vision of the calling, some of you are called in business, in your ministry, spiritual, wherever you are, God wants to prosper you, He wants to bless you, He wants to take you into that place of changing this world. So that's all part of changing your identity. So the vision of the logos, as you see it there in the middle of that page, to transform every student's identity, spirit, soul, body, relationships, and ministry to the identity of the image of God, the fullness of the character of the true triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as described by Paul Christ in us, the hope of glory. Now, that's what we are here for. I'm not here to teach you about a few demons. I'm here to transform your identity to become like Christ. I want you to operate on this planet as if you are Jesus Christ. Obviously, you are not, but you are representing him. You're going to speak like him. You're going to minister like him. You're going to sit with him in the right hand of the Father. And that's your position. That's where God wants to bring your identity, that you really know that you know who you are in him. Right, next page, dominion and freedom. <clears throat> a few <clears throat> sorry, a few remarks that I'm doing there in the first few lines. I I I think that about fifty percent of all people who make a choice for Jesus Christ will eventually just fall back, or we call it backslide, um, not continue their choice for Jesus. So if I have 10 people coming forward to say, I want to accept Jesus, uh, eventually maybe f- f- half of them, five, will disappear and maybe turn their back even on God. And then I'm asking, why is this happening? Why is there so many people? Actually, if you study evangelistic statistics. If a great evangelist come to South Africa and pick up, put up a big tent and there's eventually said that uh, 10,000 people accepted Jesus through his crusade, you go and study these 10,000 people, you will find that up to 90% of them, 9 out of 10, will disappear eventually. They will not be going anywhere. And the other 10% who, who stay with Jesus actually were already in churches. They, they just came back to him. Now, why are people backsliding or leaving what the choices that they've made? <clears throat> Two things. One is what we did in the previous seminar, uh, emotional wounds. That's not being dealt with. Most people, about every person, has deep emotional wounds. If you accept Jesus Christ, it's only the beginning that your spirit is renewed. It's not good enough to be born again. I mean, you have to be, <clears throat> again, born again in your soul dimension. So your born again experience is a spiritual thing. Your soul is not renewed through that. So your wounds and your emotions are still there after becoming a Christian. So to become a Christian, be born again, it's not good enough. That only secure heaven. But it does not secure heaven on earth for you in your soul. Your soul needs to be healed and restored. That's what we did in the previous seminar, is to, to, to help you to understand you need emotional or soul therapy, soul healing, that your soul can be restored and that you can have a... I mean, and, and if I help someone to come to Jesus, that is spirit, I need to help him with his soul dimension to become a complete whole person. Now, also, again, in his soul dimension comes with deliverance, what we do this weekend. Because demons, for you guys, are not in your spirit. So demons has got no access to your spirit because your spirit is be born again for those who are born again. Satanists or people in cults, their spirit is linked to that demonic thing. 
So they are worshipping through their spirit that thing. So their spirit is well and alive in Satan or in that demon that they are worshipping. But your spirit is being made new through the born again experience, the miracle of God, and your spirit is now in God and God in you. So when demons operate and, and come into your life, it's nothing to do with your spirit. They only attach themselves or they actually were attached to you already even before your, your conversion to your soul dimension and to your body. And that's where we cast him out. And we get to that later to just to, 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 to understand the practicalities about it. So most people that say yes to Jesus and eventually fell back, it's because we didn't help them with emotional healing. We didn't help them to get demons out of them. Because to say yes is not automatic deliverance like many pastors and churches are preaching. I mean, most people out there, churches say, man, uh, when you accept Jesus, you are 100%. I mean, uh, it amazes me that pastors can think that. Just accept Jesus and you are, you are finished. You can go to heaven now, you are ready. And that's what many are just doing. They are living on the level of, I mean, get people to accept Jesus and I mean, let them just wait for Jesus to come and fetch them. Let's go on to the rest. Your, your conversion is the beginning. That's the new birth. You are a little baby. And this baby needs a lot of change and growth in their lives. And you need deliverance. You need healing. And you'll see it as we continue. So another statement I make there is 80% of church members have little or no spiritual growth because of blockages in their soul dimension. And uh, can I give you a picture quickly, a mental picture? Let's... Let's play for a moment. There's a big <clears throat> water reservoir <clears throat> there behind me here. A big water thing that is filled with water. Big, these water tanks, you all see that? And this thing is full to the rim. Actually, the water is just coming over the, the top of it. Now, we, we take a water pipe, and here at the bottom is, is a place to put in that pipe, you know, that you can click it into this this. Uh, reservoir and now there's a pipe and there's a tap here in front of this pipe so when I open this tap uh, there's a strong stream of water coming out because of this pressure of the water you all get that picture now I want to spiritualize that for a moment this tank is God he's abundant he's overflowing everything in life is always overflowing now you become a Christian we take you and pluck you into God. You are in Him. Now, when you are plucked into Him, when we open your tap, what is in God should flow out of you. You understand that? The fullness of God should become the fullness of you. I mean, the life of God must flow out of you. When you open your mouth, everything you do should be like God. But what is happening now? We are opening your tap, and what comes out? Cook, cook, cook. A few drops. And we're looking into this, you know. And I come and I pray for you and shake you and hope there's some, something must come out, you know. And all that's coming out is cook, cook. The Bible says, rivers of living water. Streams of living water will come out of you. But most Christians don't have that. So what's wrong? Is the problem with God? Or do you think it's maybe with this pipe that we call your life? Because in this pipe are some frogs and grass and mud and rubbish. And it's blocking the flow of the water. And now we need to get this out of the pipe so that the full life of God can flow through you. And that's why we are here. That's why you need emotional healing. That's why you need deliverance. That's to get all the frogs out of your pipe so that God's streams can come full out through you. And everything in that pipe needs to be shaken out. Now I'm not going to shake it out that way. It's coming out by allowing the Holy Spirit to identify the frogs and the flies and the rats. To confess it, to open it up. 
recognize it, deal with that, to forgive those who put those frocks in your life because every pain and everything came from someone in your life, even yourself. And then allow the Holy Spirit to heal you and bring that deliverance. And then that pipe starts getting... And the more we minister to you, the more water is coming out. The more we work with this pipe, pipe, the stronger the stream comes. That's why some of you are powerful in the Spirit. And some of you are strong. I mean, if you pray for someone, the Holy Spirit touch them. Then you get some other guys, man, as if they pray, everything dies. It's just nothing coming out. I mean, there's, there's just total drought. And we need to get in that pipe, into your life, to see what is blocking this rivers of living water of God. God wants to flow powerfully through you. That's the only reason I'm in, in this ministry, you know, because God has called me to bring the fullness of Christ out of your life. That's all I'm interested in. And if there's a demon in a way, we will destroy it. We have to get it out. If it's pain, a wound in your life, we have to get it out. But the life of God needs to flow powerfully out of you. And that's, that's life. And therefore, I know some people are afraid of demons. and Don't talk too loud. They are afraid when I speak about Satan. You know, I've heard Wormley's reverence, pastors say, you know, don't speak about them because then they come to you and they're going to give you a hard time. So just ignore them. I mean, that's stupidity. In the just imagine you have a beautiful lounge. You just bought a new lounge suit, you know, leather stuff and everything is so nice. New carpets. You have a beautiful lounge. It's just so beautiful. And your front door is open and a skunk, you know, a maison came in. And it's dripping, you know, full of a lot of lice and cocos, whatever. And it's dirty, full of mud, and it's smelling like death. And here this thing is coming into your lounge on your new carpet and it gets onto your bench, you know, that stretch itself out. And you say to your children, "Um, let's ignore him. Let's pretend it's not here. We just go on with life as if there's nothing here. Don't talk about him. Maybe he will do something to us. You know. that, that's, that's how most churches and Christians are operating. Their homes are smelling demonically. Their lives are stinking. They're full of sickness, disease. Their money is not working. Their marriages are falling apart. Their lives are falling apart. But they are too scared to clean out their house. They don't know how to do it, and they they don't want to touch that area because their theology, their understanding is blocking them. In the meantime, it's it's so unique to just live in a life of freedom. Your house should be clean. Adam and Eve made the same mistake. That creepy crawly came in. In The same scripture that that God gave to us in, in, in Luke 10. He said, you will tread on scorpions and snakes and overcome the enemy with all his power and he will not harm you. That same scripture was applicable to Adam and Eve in the garden. You will tread on snakes and scorpions. And that snake came in. Adam and Eve converse with the snake. Listen to it instead of killing it. And that's what most people are doing. You know, we are, we are allowing the enemy to, to speak to us. We listen to it. We are deceived by it. We are afraid to get rid of it out of our lives instead of ruling in our garden. Where your cult, your household, your family, your marriage, your business is your garden. And you have to keep the snake out. You have to work your garden and you have to rule in your garden. As Adam and Eve had to do it, the same job. And the same threat is there that the snake is standing at the door 
He wants to come in like He came in with Adam and Eve. He was there in the garden. He's there with your garden. He wants to come in. And it's either your choice to keep Him out. And you know, you don't have to be demon-focused to do that. You don't have to talk about Satan all the time. You just keep the door closed. You just rule in your garden. When you see him looking through the mirror, you must just know how to stand in Christ and say, in Jesus' name, out, gone. I'm ruling in this place. You're not afraid. I mean, he's, he's weak. He has no power. I want to say it very clear. The demons need to hear this tonight. Satan has got no power. He has, has got only power that people give him. I know it. I've, I've been, I mean, Satan is standing in front of me, threatening me, I will kill you. And then, then it's a test of powers. You know, what's in me and in you, who is the greatest? And what are you going to do when Satan stands in front of you? Or a Satanist that says, I will kill you. Because you better know who you are. Greater is him that's in me than in you. And it's not just a little bit greater. Christ in me and in you is ten times, ten times, thousand, you know, ten to the ten. And even more than that, greater than Satan in his weak, weak power. I've, I've had it that, that people in front of me say they will kill me, demonic people. And I said, man, you can't even lift your hand. And then they try to lift their hand and they cannot. I mean... I mean, it's so interesting. The moment you declare power, truth, God comes and operates in that. They cannot do that. And, and God's, I had Satanist leaders saying, asking me, where do you get that power you have? We've never seen that. And no church that we've been in, we've seen this power. I said, no, it's not, I, I'm not very special. What I have is what every Christian should have. The only reason they don't have it is because of wrong education, wrong teaching, wrong atmosphere, and they don't know who they are in Christ. And my mission is to get every Christian that's prepared to walk in Christ, to live with the same anointing, even greater. I expect my sons to have a double anointing what I have. It's not difficult. If God is used a sorrow of an amara who could fail school and was useless in many things, and he used me, to help people, to help thousands of people, man, he can use you for far more. And it's no, it's no superman, it's no difficult. It's just you have to discover who you are in Christ. You need to understand the principles of God and operate in that. And then you sleep so nice, enjoy God's peace, his joy. You get up in the morning and say, Lord, I've said it this week, you know, I, I just got up and I had so much peace. And so, Lord, it's, it's really so much fun to be alive. It's so great to just send you goodness. You are so faithful every day. I don't have to perform. I don't have to pray for two hours to just feel better. Just get up and enjoy my Father. Talk to Him and be in His presence. And sense the victory that I'm part of. It's not mine, but he draw me into his. We are in a victory procession of our Christ as we take the enemy on their journey to their final destination called hell. Hell is prepared for Satan and his demons. By the way, we get to it. I'm a bit slow now. But Satan is not living in hell, by the way. Hell is not the dwelling place for demons. That's your wrong Sunday school teaching. Satan is so afraid of hell, he won't get close to it. Because at the end of the age, when Christ comes, Satan will be cast into hell. And he stays very far away from hell. So the only people that is guarding hell, and that's a place of destruction, is God's angels. They are working there. Satan is not working there and doing the fire, you know, and 
prepare a hot seat for those who are going to come and have a welcome, you know, committee and say welcome, come and take your seat. I'm looking forward to have you here. He's not there. One day he's going to be there. And the Bible says he will be the lowest of all. He will have the most pain of all. And he's the last one to get in there. Let's go on with our questions which need to be answered. Now I've put these questions in because I, I run continuously into Christians that think they're very clever and make say certain things. So the typical things that we need to answer in this, in this uh, weekend that uh, we will try to answer all of this. Is spiritual warfare still part of the end time church's responsibility? Did Jesus finish all spiritual warfare on the cross? If yes, why did the apostles not understand it and still kept on motivating us to be engaged in warfare? Because I find a lot of people say that, that, that um, you know, Jesus finished it all. If Satan was crucified, like some people say, or killed on the cross, who is causing all the turmoil and trouble in the world? If, say, if warfare is a responsibility of angels, like others say, say it's not our job, God gave it to the angels, they must fight the demons. Why is the Bible not telling us to leave it to their initiative? If the angels helped us as the sons of God to do spiritual warfare, what is our responsibility in warfare? That's a good question. What must we do with all the scriptures commanding us to do warfare? And we're going to try to answer that. Jesus only, and this is a very strong statement because I'm going to prove it to you in one of the paragraphs. Jesus only comes back when all his enemies are subjected under his feet. And that shakes a lot of end time theology and all the movies that you've watched. Who will be responsible to surrender the enemy under his feet? And I will prove to you that it's us as the church to bring the enemy under the feet of Christ before he comes back. And uh, that's pure biblical teaching, and that's in your Bible, and not fancy stories that other people dream about and then make movies about. Luke 13, verse 32. And he said to them, and this is Jesus, he said to them, Go and tell that fox. Now that fox was Herod, the king, uh, was ruling there, who, who to ask some questions about Jesus. So he said, go and tell that fox. That's quite a way to speak to your president. Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I finish my course. Now that's, that's very profound, prophetic. The third day, obviously, Jesus rose from the dead when he finished his course there. But this is also a prophetic scripture. That's why I've put it in here as God is speaking about us. And I have an old teaching on that about the, the third day church. We are the third day church. And God is finishing his course through the third day church. That's the day of resurrection. That's a church that lives in this season as the, the church that rose with Christ, be seated with him, and he's bringing the enemy under his feet. We are... Third day church is a church who lives in the third room of the tabernacle in the Holy of Holies. The third day church is a church who sits with Christ in heavenly places. Third day church is a church that took everything that Christ did for us. We die of Him, we rise, rose with Him, and we are seated with Him in heavenly places. And there's a lot of scriptures talking about the third day that God is going to change it. And we are living now in the third day after Christ. One day in the Bible is like a thousand Days, years, sorry, the Bible says. And uh, so we are now entering the third, third thousand years after Christ. So the first two days just finished a few years ago. We are now entering the third day, the third thousand years after Christ. So it's very applicable in terms of that. There's a lot of prophetic being said about this, that we are now in the third day, the resurrection day, the final day of Christ coming back, the harvest, and uh, the Feast of Tabernacles. This is the greatest season ever in the history of the church. This is the greatest season where we'll see the fullness of Christ manifest on this earth, the power of God, the glory of God. There's so many great things that's going to happen. It's busy happening at the moment, and we may not miss that. We are really living in the best season ever in history. So don't miss out. 
Don't be involved in their churches, you know, busy worshiping dead stuff. God is well and alive, powerful, and move with what he's doing as God is operating on this earth, bringing the enemy on his feet as we bring thousands of people to Jesus, bring them into the fullness of God and his life. So be part of that. All right. Another scripture I have there is Exodus 15 verse 3. I love this. It's a great song that we, we've sung years ago. Maybe we must start singing it again. The Lord is a warrior, it says. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. And God in his nature is a warrior. I want you to just understand that. God is Father. He is grace. He is love. But he is a fighter. He is a warrior. And that same spirit of God in fighting as he has placed into your life. Let's stand for a moment.